a quick plug for for wrenchway and i won't go into too much detail here because as with everything we do we don't want this to be a sales promo for wrenchway right we we don't want this to be all about wrenchway but we do have a lot of different solutions uh, because this is a school crowd i just want to point out our top schools and school connect programs uh, still growing those and what we want is feedback from educators on how can we improve this how can we make your lives easier and so you can reach out to me at any time you can reach out to any of the uh, our marketing staff uh, but we love feedback right we want to hear what makes your life easier and uh, and really be able to uh, to help us grow the platform ultimately with growing the platform we feel like that's going to help make your life easier that's the whole point of it in the first place uh, so please uh, please be sure to uh, to reach out to us with feedback uh, and with that, I'm going to stop sharing here, and we're going to get to our panelists. Who I uh, we had a, a pre-call yesterday, a pre-meeting yesterday, and uh, it was such a fun conversation, and one that I think a lot of you are going to take a lot out of, and hopefully take back to your schools and implement. So, uh, and I, I see George, you made it. Uh, happy to have you, my friend. He, he's here. He's here. All right, so let's uh, let's go around uh, the table here quick, uh, do some brief introductions, uh, name and where you're from, maybe a little background on you, and then we'll uh, we'll go from there. Uh, Britton, would you mind starting us off? Sure. Uh, name is Britton Hill. Um, I'm at Johnson County Community College. We're in a suburb of Kansas City, Kansas. Um, and I have been here at the college in a full-time capacity for a little over a year. Um, I, I did some adjunct teaching uh, here for a few years and I actually started uh, my relationship with the college uh, as an advisory board member. So um, before that, I was working in a, in a shop, a BMW shop for about 15 years. What I love about the, the insight that Britton brings to this conversation is he's got a little sprinkle of that, that industry knowledge too, right? And I think it's important as a school that we understand both sides of the equation, that we understand that industry side, maybe some of the struggles that they have, and especially as it relates to growing an advisory committee, right? You have to have some knowledge of what their struggles are in industry. Uh, and honestly, you've got to have that, that, that connection with them so that you can share your struggles as a school with them, and hopefully they can step up to the table and help you out. So uh, great to have you today, Britton. Uh, John, uh, how are you doing today? Oh, doing good. Uh, I'm John Hayes. I'm currently teaching in Green Lake High School in Green Lake, Wisconsin. Uh, I've got about eight years of teaching experience, including at the tech college level, and about 30 years experience in the field as a ASE world-class certified tech. So. so you might have a future in this business, it sounds like. I might have. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've, uh, you've, uh, you'll be the classic "you've forgotten more than I'll ever know" uh, type of person. So, uh, appreciate you joining us. Uh, it kind of, somewhat in our backyard. Green Lake's not in our backyard, but it's a gorgeous, gorgeous part of the country. So, uh, appreciate you, you, uh, you joining us. And then, last but not least, the infamous George Arents, one of my good buddies in the industry. Uh, George, tell us a little bit about you. If uh, it, it, I'll start by saying. If you don't know who George is, I think you're hiding under a rock. George is kind of everywhere. So, uh, uh, George, a uh, little bit about you. Uh, thanks, Jay. Um, George Aarons, Vice President of the ASD Education Foundation. I uh, taught high school and college automotive at one time. My wife is pretty demanding. She wanted some of the finer things in life, food, shelter, and clothing. So I had to take on another occupation. But uh, been working with schools across the country for 20-something years. and. Uh, Excited to be here. And we're excited to have you. ASE uh, and the education side are doing a lot of great uh, things in this, this specific topic, right? There's a lot of resources that the ASE Education Foundation has for all of you. Uh, and uh, we'll talk a little bit about that with George. I think it's important to know what resources are available to you and, uh, and, and really how to utilize those and make sure that you're looking at them consistently. So uh, as always, appreciate George taking time out of his busy schedule uh, uh, to join us. Uh, so I wanna start off with kind of a, a baseline question and 
uh, really why we're here today. And, and that is, why is it important to build a strong advisory committee? I think there's some schools from, from my vantage point that do a fantastic job with it, are very engaged with their advisory committee. I think there's other schools that, quite frankly, don't do a good job at it, right? And, and might view it as more of a check the box type of thing to get an accreditation or to get whatever they need. So I, I wanna start with you, Britton, and, and you've been on both sides of the equation with an advisory committee, but uh, why is it important that we prioritize this and spend time on building a, a good advisory committee? Well, I, I think the first one is just developing that industry partnership and, and um, having, having those advocates for you in your program, um, and and they can even advocate uh, with administration for your program. Um, so I, I think that's a really a, an important part of that. Well, and I think you you just hit on something that we didn't even talk about yesterday, which is advocating for your department when it comes to school administration. Right? There's such an important piece there where you need people in your corner when you have some of these conversations and. Uh, if we're being honest, our, our programs are not cheap programs to run. So I, I think that's a that's an excellent point. John, would you have anything that you'd add there in terms of uh, the importance of an advisory committee or really why we why we should be prioritizing this? Yeah, because it it really is not only our tie to the community, but when you show data to admin that hey, there's a lot of jobs open in this field, that's one thing. But when your advisory committee is saying we need people and they're hearing it from the place where they bought their car from, they're hearing it right in our community, it really starts to ring true. And they really are, I call them my field artillery I mean, uh, for our army. And when I need something, it's not me that needs it. It's the program. It's the kids. It's the field that needs it. I've literally gone into an advisory board meeting in dire need of an alignment machine and come out of that with a blank check for 20 grand to get one just because it came from the advisory committee and not me. Well, that's the power of relationships too, right? Is I think you have something that all shops need, which is young people coming into the industry. and. At times, I think it's important for, for all of you programs out there to understand maybe what your shortcomings are or what you're struggling with and be okay with it. Uh, uh, you know, being upfront and the fact that you went to an advisory committee meeting and said, hey, you know what? We need an alignment machine. We Like in order to teach this and put out quality students for industry, that's something that we desperately need. And I'm super, super happy to see that uh, somebody really stepped up to the plate and and uh, and donated that. George, anything to add? I, I know you're a, a strong, strong advocate of uh, advisory committees. Well, to John's point also, it justifies the investment. You're spending taxpayer dollars and your advisory committee members are both personal and professional taxpayers in your community. And it's important to hear from them of what is important to them to properly prepare young people for the workforce. But more than anything else, how do you make program improvement without asking your customer, how do we do? And the only way to do that is industry involvement. Yeah, and we're gonna dive into a lot of a lot of ways that we can do that, a lot of ways that we can engage our advisory committee as we go. Uh, but let's start with the people first. The, you know, when, when you're looking at this, I'm guessing, and for those of you that are listening, uh, if you've got some comments on where your, where your program stands at in terms of advisory uh, committee involvement or participation, feel free to, to drop them in the comments. But uh, I think what from, again, from my eyes, what I see is that uh, there are a lot of different programs in a lot of different states, right? There's, uh, in, when I say states, in different uh, maturity levels of their advisory uh, program where some are really, really good at it and have a built up base. I think those are, they tend to be the stronger programs that are out there. Uh, whereas there's some, and I've seen it with maybe a new instructor coming into a school where uh, they don't have a strong advisory committee, and maybe it's just you know them kind of grabbing the reins and going. Uh, but I, I want to ask 
the three of you, how do you go about building a strong uh, advisory committee? And maybe you've got that mid-tier advisory committee where you've got people in it, but they're not overly engaged. Uh, what type of person are you looking for? And and uh, how do you get them engaged? And how do you get them actually uh, being a part of your school? And Britton, I'll start with you. Yeah, so our advisory board um, is fairly mature. Um, and and fairly built out and and we have a wide variety of folks on our advisory board so every everybody from a technician uh to shop owners uh you know uh industry recruiters so we try to get a very uh wide variety of folks um who are bringing different voices uh to the board meeting um so i'm fortunate in that a lot of that work has already been done, but um, you know, it is, it's about relationships. And I think one of the first important things is, you know, uh, choose people who you think you might be able to work well with, right? And, and uh, who you enjoy being around, that might be a first, great first step, you know, uh, and maybe somebody who brings a lot of wisdom from the industry um, especially if you're just getting started, uh, maybe somebody who could even be uh, a, a mentor to you in, in that respect. That's and that is really good advice. I think even for those of you that have established advisory committees, that relationship part is so important in being in touch with them and being able to uh, to not make it that conversation. I know when I talk to a lot of schools, they get very frustrated with the fact that shops only tend to show up at graduation time. And I think some of it is being able to proactively communicate. So even if you have an established advisory committee, uh, being able to talk with them and getting to know them and maybe even getting to know their families. I know when I was on the industry side, I had all of the instructors uh, for the diesel program at our local tech school uh, come to my wedding. Uh, I mean, I was very, very close with, still am very close with them. Uh, but it is, you know, that next level relationship that I think helps build that. And that takes maintenance, that takes time. And John, I'm curious with you, is that something that you look at consistently and in, in how you're talking with, with uh, the folks on your advisory committee? Um, yeah, because normally, it's real common for you to have apprentices working at the businesses that are making up your advisory committee, advisory board. Um, so doing those bi-weekly check-ins, hey, what's going on? What are you seeing? How's he doing? You see any skills he's lacking? So you're constantly updating your program as well through that ongoing communication. Yeah, and there's a lot of things to communicate when you sit back and think about it, right? The different types of projects you're working on. That was one thing that I think is difficult from an industry standpoint when you go into those meetings is a lot of times you're going through curriculum, you're going through you know current enrollment. And from the industry side, it, it, you're kind of running in, you know, huffing and puffing because you just finished up something at work and you're running to that advisory committee or if it's eight o'clock in the morning, you're getting the kids out the door and driving, you know, an hour away and you get there. And I, I think it's just being able to recall what it was that you talked about in the last conversation in a way that's maybe more than just the minutes. Uh, I, I do think that's important. Uh, George, any advice to those out there on how uh, to uh, maintain relationships with with uh, your advisory committee? First thing is you got to get out of the classroom and go meet them on, on their turf. You got to go out and find the guy or gal whose name's on the marquee and introduce yourself. Um, you've got to expand your advisory committee, employers, technicians, HR personnel, staffing agencies. You allow your suppliers to help you. They know where all the, the shops are. Don't just look at dealers and independent shops. Look at fleets and all different types of uh, companies that need your students. Um, those, those are the ways to grow your advisory committee. There's also this funny thing called the Yellow Pages. It's the darndest little book. <laughs> and anybody who advertises in um, auto repair, anybody there is a potential advisory committee member and anybody who works for them. So, you know, utilize your local resources. Yeah, and, and I, I oh go ahead, Britt. 
Sorry, I just add to that. In this environment right now, we're, we're really not having any problems finding advisory board meetings. They're contacting us. Hey, can we be on your advisory board? Um, and so, you know, if you're building one, this is a great time to do it. Um, and, you know, we're at the point where we're, you know, uh, we're, we're able to be a little selective with that. Again, uh, picking folks that businesses that we know are, are doing it well right and are treating employees great and and that's where we want to send students and have you told anybody no um maybe not in so many words but uh <laughs> maybe, they, maybe they just don't get an invitation uh, yeah so um but you know what just even inviting people out i mean you can always invite somebody um just as a guest hey, would you mind being a guest to an advisory board meeting or having them come out for a tour of your of your program? Um, I was just on the phone this morning ordering a part uh, for somebody and a uh, local Napa store and I got the owner on the phone and he's like, oh, hey, I've been wanting to come out to see your guys' program. I'm like, great, when do you want to come? And he, you know, so we made an appointment for Thursday. <laughs> that's awesome though. I mean, that you talk about relationships, that's, trying to move that relationship into the next level, right? And trying to establish a relationship that'll be beneficial. Now, when we get the people there, when we get advisory committee members on board, I, I wanna talk about kind of the meeting first, right? And the reason for that is I think a lot of the communication tends to happen at the meetings themselves. And then maybe we'll talk about maybe the communication gaps over the course of a year, uh, but, I want to start with the meeting in regard to what's the point, right? And Britton, you and I had a little talk about this yesterday where I've been in those advisory committees where I'm sitting there and I'm listening and I'm like, why am I here? What, what is the point of this thing other than to get the box checked? Uh, when you look at it, what is the point? What, it, like when you look at an advisory committee meeting, what, what is the point of uh, gathering all those people there? Yeah, uh, same same thing, Jay. When I first started advisory board meeting, I mean, some some meetings were great, and then some meetings felt like, uh, yeah, just very informational, and like, okay, well, that's great. You could have sent that in an email, um, and so, yeah, you really want your meeting. I mean, the, those people are taking their time to be there, and and they want, you know, they want to give their input, so you know, preparing a couple of questions uh, that you want answers to and, and sending those out beforehand um, to get people to start, start thinking about those things. But really, yeah, utilize that time and utilize their knowledge. Um, make sure you're taking advantage of that. From a, in my mind, visual, I, I think you did a really good job at depicting it. In your opinion, should it be more conversational or more informational or somewhere in between? Yeah, I, I mean, you have to share information about your program and they need to kind of know that. And, and that is an important part, I think, of the advisory board is kind of a this, it's a way to like make the public aware of what you're doing, right? And so, um, but, but yeah, if it's purely informational, then like I say, you, you could send that out in an email or a slide deck or whatever, and, and that's fine. I think people come because they want to be part of something and they want to contribute. John, do you see anything similar to that in terms of, have you had a meeting that turned overly informational rather than conversational? Or uh, what is your experience with uh, advisory committee meetings? Um, so it's, it seems I'm always in the process of building. There's always stuff we had to talk about. Um, and the information kind of went both ways. One good story that's embarrassing, about a, just about a year into teaching, I've got my first apprentices out there and we have our advisory board meeting about three weeks after he starts. And they come in and they go, John, you teach these kids how to use a hoist, right? I go, yeah, look, we got six of them. Of course I, 
They go, he, he can't hoist a car. What do you mean he can't hoist a car? I see him do it all the time. And all of our kids, everybody learns at entry level. That's one of the first things we do. Well, here, all my cars were always in the shop. They'd never had to pull it in. So he, <laughs> such a tiny piece, but yeah, never had to center the car on hoist. Never had to pull it up. And some of those Critical shops don't piece. have the easiest entry to a hoist. They, they can be a challenge. Yeah, so that's one of those pieces of feedback that you absolutely have to have because you can't be teaching six, seven, eight years and have kids, you know, coming out that many that don't know how to hoist a car. So you get that kind of feedback too, which is absolutely critical to have. Um, but yeah, we're either, we're either covering skills or we're looking at equipment. So we're talking about what to get, but I've never had one really go totally dry like that fortunately. But that, I mean, you talk about feedback and something that, you know, you had a blind spot on. I'm really happy that you, you told us about that because I guarantee you're not the only one that's ever done that, right? Like, I, I think that's probably happened multiple times, but something that seems so obvious, it's hard to understand that unless you get that feedback, right? And I think having something like that, yes, you learn a lesson, but it helps you improve the program. And, and I, I think it helps make a student more job ready when uh, they actually do know how to pull a, a vehicle uh, into the stall uh, and, and properly uh, hoist it. So uh, that's a really interesting take, something I had never even thought about. So uh, I'm, I'm really happy that you shared that. Yeah, we just kind of take it for, for you know, granted, it's second nature. But yeah, yeah I, always, I would always tell my uh, potential advisory board people that this is your chance to order at the factory. We build to suit. You tell us what skills you need to see, we'll get them in the program for you. That's great. Uh, George, I, I, I want to get your take on that. With an advisory committee meeting, uh, I thought it was really fascinating that Britton brought up the conversational versus um, informational. Uh, in your experience, I, I'm sure you've probably sat in one or two of these advisory committee meetings by now, uh, right? Uh, maybe, maybe a couple. Uh, but uh, what have you seen out of advisory committee meetings? Uh, informational or conversational or uh, just uh, any any additional tips for these folks that are listening? A lot of times it's instructor or administration talks and industry listens, which is completely wrong. Um, you got to have the what's in it for me. Before you invite anybody to an advisory committee meeting, you have to cover the what's in it for me for them or don't, don't invite them. It's just like wasting your time when you sit in a meeting. And when you determine you're going to do an advisory committee, you start with the what's in it for me and what you expect to accomplish in that meeting. And then you work backwards to create your agenda. And what you're constantly doing is asking for feedback from business and industry to help you make program improvements. And a lot of times I don't see that. Also, industry should be running the meeting and not you or your administration. Um, you're the worst person as an instructor to run your meeting. If something needs to be done, how do you look at your boss and go, when are you gonna take care of that? But I have no problem looking at your boss and saying, when are you gonna take care of that? Making sure it's in the meeting minutes and on our next meeting, I'm gonna say, did you take care of that? You know, so it's, it's those type of things. Now, industry may not, be able to uh, set up the agenda, but you would work with them and, 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 and create some talking points, but they know how to run a meeting. So let them drive the train. And you have to focus on things that are important to them first, you know, and, and, that's, what it, and that's what it comes down to. And a lot of times we forget they're the customer and you got to ask them, what do they need? And, and I can't tell you how many times in an advisory committee, nobody's asked industry, what do you need? And, and that's that's kind of where the problem starts. It is. And uh, Britton, I feel like I've, I've heard this somewhere else before, too. <laughs> yeah, we talked a little bit about that, about a lot of times, I think uh, schools feel like it's, it, yeah, it's their job to run that advisory meeting, and it really should be the other way around. Um, and you're like, 
like uh, you said, just, yeah, you're working with them, um, but they're doing that. Is it hard to view them as your customers or uh, hard to be able to uh, like, let me rephrase that question altogether. One of the common issues that I see is that you get a room full of people with great ideas, with a lot of great ideas, uh, and being able to really pare that down to things that are manageable, right? Because I think, and John, I might start with you on this one, because I think one of the things that I've noticed, and especially at the high school level, one of the beauties of these roundtables is that we've got different backgrounds, right? We've got uh, uh, somebody from high school, somebody from tech school, but at the high school level, it, it feels at times that industry is asking too much of a high school. And when I say that, it's not just automotive. It's not just diesel that's going into your classroom. You've got a bunch of different trades. And I know there's some programs that uh, across the country that are excellent and have specific automotive programs. There's a lot that don't now. But having all of these people kind of pull at you, does it feel like you're running thin at times? Yeah, I, I'm kind of reminded as, as you're laying that out of an old cartoon it was an ad looking for a technician 20 to 23 years old preferably with 15 years experience and you know walking the advisory board through what i do in the high school because i break them down into one three and five year skills i get them ready to go as an entry level tech no, they probably never torn down an automatic transmission. And realistically, when they go to work, you're not going to let them touch one for six or seven years. So we want to focus on having them successful and giving that customer, the dealership, independent shop, wherever, that quality product that they're looking for. And it's kind of like... Uh, their expectations might be high, but you just kind of got to walk them through. We can't stock the pond with carp and try to catch walleye. It's a, it's a good point. And those base level skills, I think when, when shops really think about it, right? Obviously there's a lot of shops that would love to have a pile of advanced diagnostic technicians, but I, I think managing expectations of what you can put out is such a big deal. And uh, I know we we briefly talked about that, but I think, John, since we're on that point, uh, how hard is it to manage expectations of industry of, you know, what what is the reality, what is the potential of that student coming out? And at times, are, are the expectations just unrealistic? Not really if you manage them and if you've got that relationship built up because they know wherever they hire from, for an entry level, whether they're coming out of tech college, whether they're coming out of high school, whether they're changing careers, they know they're gonna start them on the loop rack. That's the realism. If you come out of UTI, great. You're gonna start on the loop rack just like everybody else did. Will you progress faster? That's kind of up to you. I think as long as they're involved with what you're doing, because they should be driving your curriculum and what skills you're focusing on. And if you, you kind of walk them through and kind of guide them, which is what I do, that I can give you somebody that's done everything once, or I can give you somebody that's done six or seven oil changes, three or four front brake services, and are really proficient at it. Britton, anything you want to add there? I'm interested from the tech school level of you know managing expectations. I thought John did a really good job of explaining that there. Yeah, and, and it's so true. I mean, we've just recently had this conversation and we kind of threw this out to our advisory board about a week ago. Uh, the idea, I mean, we're, we're an ASC accredited school and we follow the MAST track. Um, it's a it's a lot of tasks. It's a lot of things yeah. to try to cover, and 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 you are lucky to get one opportunity to maybe do each of these tasks. And what we find is at the end, it's like one one time's not enough uh, for a lot of things. And so 
you know, we're having this discussion, do we need to maybe not be a MAST? Maybe we pair back a little bit so we can spend more time on the kind of key tasks that they need to do um, and be proficient at to be, you know, great entry level technicians. I feel like you're almost saying do a few things really, really well rather than trying to do a bunch of things kind of all right. George, yeah. anything that to add? I agree. Just, well, just a, that's um, the, I, I was going to say, George, that is the least amount of words I've heard in a response from you ever. Now, so, Britton, you are correct. I'm going to be honest with you. Most schools, their ego are doing their talking and egos are fat free and we need to swallow them. It's not about me. It's not about the level of accreditation you earn. It's what is important to business and industry. And a lot of times the AST level, the mid-level is where industry wants you to be so that you have the time for the repetition that John was talking about. At the high school level, it's MLR. Uh, master level, you know, at a high school level is just, I'm sorry, it's somebody's ego talking. Are, the true, are those skills truly what in the local business needs in an entry level tech? And the answer is no. And that's where the importance of advisory committees and allowing them to help you understand what's important to them and also making your life easier as an instructor and an administrator to teach what's important to them and not that I've got to say that I'm a master certified program. You know, yeah. it's, it's all about the students and the people that hire them. Everybody else is just in my way. Yes. That's a, a great feedback. Now, one of the things that I think is really interesting about advisory committees is how awkward they can be at times. And when I say that, there's a lot of times where we're bringing direct competitive shops together in a room, right? And it, it can create kind of this weird tension where nobody talks. I think we've probably all been in an advisory committee meeting where uh, everybody is really afraid of sharing information. They're afraid of, uh, of really uh, divulging any trade secrets. Britain, I, I, I can't be alone in that regard, right? There, there's had to have been some, some awkward advisory committee meetings where you can't get anybody to talk. Yeah, I mean, just try to start talking about wages. <laughs> no, <laughs> nobody wants to share anything about wages. Um, uh, but no, I mean, again, going back to like how you're running your meeting and and are you know are, are you creating spaces in your meeting for this discussion to happen, or are you just like standing up front and saying, "Hey, I have this question," right? And I, you know, as educators, we we actually have like some knowledge in this area. How do we how do we get people to discuss things? And I think we can use a lot of the same techniques, you know. But even just your room setup. But we were talking about this uh, after our advisory meeting because we were in a room that it was a classroom, so people were in rows, and and it was not very conducive to conversation. Um, and so we need to revisit that and find a different room where maybe we can put people around tables, like round tables and, and create those spaces. Hey guys, take, you know, five, 10 minutes, discuss this question at your table. Then we'll, then we'll discuss it as a group type of thing, just to get, get the conversation going. If it's like a room full of people and you're singling out one person, um, yeah, totally awkward. <laughs> it is. And I, I've been on the other end of that and it does get to the point and I'm never one to just back off of sharing. I'll share everything every time, uh, probably to a fault, but I do see it where when I've been on the other side of that table and you, uh, you almost feel obligated to say something because it's such an awkward, like just an awkward tense, gathering and i think breaking people off into smaller groups might be a really good idea to get people engaged and get them talking maybe create a little buzz in the room so there's a little bit more activity going on i think that's a really good idea uh and, and one thing that i think is really important are the being prepared and and maybe having some questions up front that you know aren't on the agenda it's not something that they can read a, ahead of time but maybe putting together some good questions that invoke thought and maybe get them thinking 
a little differently. Uh, Britton, have you ever been able to uh, come to the table with questions that maybe were, uh, to, I guess, to try and get the conversation rolling? Uh, are you, like icebreakers or? <laughs> kind of, I guess, even even just to get people talking, right? Yeah, well, um, yeah, I think you could do that. I mean, was, sometimes we do that with our classes. I'll, I'll just throw a question up on the board. So as students come in, uh, you know, they can sit down and start looking at that and start having those thoughts uh, in your mind. Again, I think for an advisory meeting, it's a pretty limited time. And so having some of those prepared questions that go out maybe before the meeting to, to get people thinking about it so they're not caught off guard. Um, and, and then again, kind of creating spaces where people in, in the meeting, uh, uh, times in the meeting where people can kind of like have some time to really think about this and discuss it amongst folks and, and make it a little less, uh, yeah, a little less singling people out or or what whatnot. You know, I think I think if there's more, I think people find too that they have more in common maybe than they have differences when when they actually have a chance to kind of talk with each other as opposed to just somebody sharing their opinion out there and then somebody else shares their opinion out there and there's that's not really a discussion necessarily right. So, yeah, and I'm going to play a clip at the very end. I was trying to figure out when I was going to play this. I think I'll save it for the end. But uh, from Tech Mission last week, where we had a, a technician on one of our roundtables talk about uh, the fact that technicians talk, right? And we're so guarded with our salary information up front, but being able to be transparent and, and if one of their major reservations is not to talk and specific to salary information, uh, it, it drives me crazy because when you hear it from the people, uh, the people that are we're actually talking about, the people that are being paid that salary, they already have a pretty good idea of what every shop is at. You know, it's 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 being able to be open to that and as a shop, not being reserved in that regard to to actually come with some ideas, come with some some input and. I think that's something we can do a better job from the industry side with as well. Uh, John, I see you're on mute. I don't know if you can answer this or not, but uh, is any any similarities on the high school level to getting direct competitors in a room together and, and maybe having uh, that awkward silence? I really haven't had that. Um, Good. All, all of mine worked really well together, but all three of them were also strongly in engaged uh, at the state level with the dealer association that's backing education, so. Yeah, yeah, uh, George, any uh, any other recommendations for, you know, if you're in that meeting and you've got kind of awkward conversation where nobody's talking, uh, the ways to get them stoked up? Well, if I'm chairing the meeting, I always open up the conversation with some ideas. And then I look to people that, you know, say, what do you think? And then you've got somebody that jumps up and then you can see in the audience, you read your audience and you know somebody else wants to say something based on what they just heard. And then you ask them, do you want to add to that? And it's amazing how they'll move through those conversations, especially if it's, if it's line items that are important to them. Like in a meeting, the first thing we ask is, what do you want in an entry level technician and I say, I'm going to take away the two easy ones. You want them to show up on time and show up every day. And everybody starts laughing. But then they talk about what it is that they're looking for. And, and it's those conversations that open up. And then that's how you move into your different agenda items as that comfort level builds. And if they start to go off in a direction, if it's a good direction, you want to feed it. But if they start to go off on a tangent, you, you got to be willing to rope them in and 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 start down uh, the next item on there and just help guide them. And that's what it is. And um, the money thing is always going to be a tough one, no ifs, ands, or buts. Um, but most of them do want to share. And this is how we manage expectations. If we truly understand what they're looking for in an entry-level individual, and there's some things that we can do, now it makes it easier for them to understand what it is that you're teaching, what the students are being exposed to, 
and what they should expect in these individuals when they show up for an internship, a work-based learning, apprenticeship, or a day on the job. I think it's, uh, you're right. The money is always the elephant in the room. Um, and I don't know that we're ever going to get around that, but I think that's great advice on how to get things going. And, and really for you instructors out there, read a room, right? Like if the, if the conversation's going, I've been in uh, meetings before where it's going and you got that momentum going and it feels good. People are talking and then I'll have an instructor step in and stop and like go to the next topic. And I'm like, oh man, we were just getting into the, the, the good stuff there. And if you could have just let it go. And I do worry a little bit about, you're trying to fit so much into a meeting that you feel like you have to get through everything. So there's don't. probably time, it, 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 go ahead, George, what were you gonna say? You don't, I don't care if you have five or 10 items on your agenda. If it's an hour meeting and you only get through the second, Finish it on time. Table it to the next meeting. Industry, as long as they feel that they're being heard and they're involved, they'll come back. It's not about the line items. It's being conscious of their time. Um, the other thing that I do at the start of every meeting, I want their name, their company, and their first car. And it's not because we're automotive. It's two things. I want to know the year of the car so I know what generation I'm working with. And I want to see the enthusiasm or lack of enthusiasm when they explain that first car. So literally in the first two and a half minutes, I know my audience pretty well, what generation and whether they're car people or not, are they engaged? And then I know who to count, who to call on first and then who I'm going to have to bring along. I think you bring up one really good point in what I love about what you just said there is, you know, get through the quality stuff, actually make it good quality uh, listening and, and uh, stuff that is captivating because most likely if you're trying to get through all the line items, you're only going to give the last two line items, uh, you know, a, a minute anyways, and it, you're just going to blow over it. So you're probably not giving that the attention it needs. But the interesting thing about what you said there, George, that I think is a really, really good suggestion or good point is that that helps you not have the same meeting every time too, right? I think I, from my experience, it feels like a lot of them are very, very redundant. And it's not the same meeting, you're right. Um, and, and conscious of their time, you know, even if you run over, industry is gonna stay because they're professional, but they're never coming back because you abuse their time, you know? and. And as long as people are engaged and they know that there's something good going on, even if you only get through, like I said, one or two items, table it to the next meeting, they're gonna come back. Or you have intermittent conversations between the first meeting and the second meeting. And Jay, I think you talked about that. There, there's gotta be something that is continue to be engaging in the committee between those two meetings. If not, you're just holding two meetings. And that that's something that we're really focused on from the platform side is trying to find ways to really show off what you're doing over the course of the year without actually having to send an email or talk to somebody in person. I think our, our platforms come a long ways, but for you tech schools out there, top schools is an excellent way to do that. Uh, showcase what you're doing so that it's not such a surprise. You're not trying to bring everybody up to speed on that meeting. Uh, give them some familiarity with you. And I think that helps you in that regard. Like when you start painting the picture of what you're doing over the course of the year, and I think it just brings better better feedback to the meeting, right? They can, rather than just showing them curriculum, you can actually show them what you're doing. And I think the more you can do that and tell your story of what you're doing at school, the easier those advisory committee meetings are because you're actually, they have some knowledge and it wasn't six months ago that you talked about it and you're kind of refreshing yourself with the minutes. I think, uh, again, very, very solid points. Uh, Britton, anything to add to what George just said there? Because I thought it was really interesting and I think you might bring some good insight there. Yeah, and I, I, I think this is probably one of the hardest things for educators is, because it's so time intensive sometimes to to keep these relationships up and and to uh, keep the communication up and and that's probably one of the biggest challenges to having these good meetings um, and so fi again finding ways um, 
you know, to do that without, without taking up a lot of your time. You just don't have it. Um, and again, so when you think about selecting uh, people, you know, you want maybe to have people who you come in contact with anyways um, and, uh, and doing that, um, you know, and what he said about keeping to the time, um, that's so important. And what we usually find is if, if there's important conversations, they're going to continue as side conversations after the meeting. And, and we all know, like we've been to trainings or whatever, as a tech, like going to dealer training, the most valuable part of going to that dealer training was just actually getting some time to hang out with other technicians and hearing what they're dealing with at their shops and, and things like that. And so I think, you know, those important conversations, you end on time, but those conversations can continue because people, you know, want, want to to uh, solve the problem, you know? Man, is that a good point. Uh, John, anything additional there? I think it, they, they had some really, really solid points there. Yeah, uh, just kind of summing it up. If, those, if that conversation is taken off for 45 minutes in the meeting, let her run. Because these advisory board meetings, as we as educators switch roles, we're not there to talk, we're there to listen. And we really want to just soak all that in. And you need to make sure that your board members are aware of the fact that I am listening and I'm I'm here to listen, not just to sit here and tell you what we're doing. Let's find out what we should be doing for the students and for our stakeholders. I've got a elephant in the room type of question uh, from the industry side and uh, George, as they're going to get their ASE accreditation, uh, this is fascinating to me. Uh, the, we went and uh, you do the, the walk around, right? Uh, you do the walk around of the school and you are doing a checklist of the tools and rating, you know, where they stand with everything. One of the, uh, one of the reservations I've had with giving a true honest assessment, I'm just being completely forthcoming here, is that I don't want to get the instructor in trouble. I, of course, I want them to do well and I want them to have a good program. Uh, but I do worry that there's a lot of people like me that go into that uh, evaluation and uh, one, they want their school to be accredited. So maybe they won't knock them for things that maybe they should. Uh, but two, I've seen it where it's more of a casual go around. Oh yeah, you know, I I, I think they're pretty good there, and they, you know, damn well they haven't even looked at that <laughs> that section. Uh, but do, how do you give uh, maybe give some advice to instructors out there on how they should communicate the way that maybe that should go right? And like, it, obviously the teachers don't want to get in trouble. But what is the what is the best way to communicate to an advisory committee on the best way to do that? Well, it's the accreditation process has a self evaluation, which is the advisory committee reviewing, and then it has the site visit, which also includes three local industry members. But remember, this is not an instructor responsibility. This is an institution responsibility. And I always start off with, you know, as an instructor or instructors, we walk through our shop every day, just like you walk through your garage and your house or your professional shop. And a total stranger walks in and goes, why is that like that? And, and what it's all about is program improvement. We don't see certain things because we're too close to it. That's why we create things like uh, facility evaluation forms. So you look at things like that. And, and if we're looking at, we're trying to help the program improve and help the program better, it's a positive event. Even if you find something that needs attention, it's a positive event. But also for instructors that have had maintenance requests put in for a year or two years and gone untouched, this is an opportunity for industry to go, why is that like that? Or why has that not been taken care of? And you, the instructor says, you know, I put in three maintenance requests and I look at the administration and go, what are you waiting for? You know what I mean? And, and I throw it back on them. And these are the things that I try to teach at times for 
uh, people to help guide the program. And we're not here to crush people. We're not here to point fingers. We're here to assist and guide, whether we're industry or, or visitors from somewhere else. And we have to know that there's no such thing as a perfect program. So everybody has room for improvement. It's just the way that we deliver it. That is maybe the best explanation of that process that I've heard. Britton, I don't know if you learned anything from that or if that's pretty, you know, uh, pretty similar to what your experience is with it. Yeah, I mean, I've again been on both sides of that. So I've, I've, I've performed those inspections and now, you know, we're receiving those and, and looking at them and, and, so, um, yeah, I, I think I've always viewed it. It is a positive thing in, in having another set of eyes on something. I mean, you're totally right when you're, when you're right up against it, I, I deal with this every day. I'm riding on the board and like, it's so weird how that, that thing. And so I have students, I can hear them behind me starting to mumble and I'm like, okay, which word did I spell wrong? Right. <laughs> and, uh, it's just that perspective. And so uh, understanding that you're just, you're bringing another set of eyes in um, that it is a, it is a positive thing. And I absolutely agree when uh, you have put in those requests to have things done and they're not getting done. That's again, where your advisory board is really your advocate, right? And they're going to step in and go, Hey, and, and sometimes they can, they're the ones who are going to move the needle. Right. And so Am I Absolutely. off base in saying in my observation that some people just go through the motions and just go check things off and maybe don't look at it overly thoroughly? Well, sometimes, but, you know, Britton or John, you know, they have a chain of command. And the chances of their talking to the person at the top of the food chain, there's two chances. They're called slim and none. But business and industry, we can get on a phone and call the top of the food chain and go, what in the heck are you doing? And it comes downhill pretty quick. And that's what you need. If industry sees that there's a concern that hasn't been addressed, then they can help you address that. And that's what you're looking for. You're looking for that person that's gonna pick up the phone and go, help me understand why we're not taking care of this facility or this uh, maintenance request or whatever it is, you know, why are you not investing my money back into a program that's going to grow my workforce? Yep. I, I think one of the things we, we talked about internally prior to this meeting is picking out things out of this conversation that you could have an entire meeting on. That might be one of those things uh, to talk about is mm -hmm. how to how to teach your uh, your advisory committee members to do, you know, to, to help you out, right, in that regard, and how to properly get people to inspect your shop so that you're getting the most bang for your buck out of that, right? I think that would, uh, that would be a great, uh, great conversation to have. Uh, we've got... Uh, and Jay, to that real quick. Yeah, go ahead, George. Real quick. If I know a senior administration official is going to be in the advisory committee, and I'm chairing it, I modify the agenda to make sure that they hear things that we need them to hear that nobody else will tell them but us. And I'm telling you, it does make a difference pretty quick. Yep. That's great advice in general. And we're actually already bumping up on our hour. Um, and, and so uh, we do have a couple questions. I'm gonna get to those in just a second. Uh, but one last question I have for the three of you is that uh, I guess my question is, how do you prioritize this? How do you, you want a great advisory committee? I think we've, we've shown or talked about why it's so important to your program and building a great program. But one of the things that I see with educators is you're either going 100 miles an hour or you're not there, right? It's some winter break or summer break or whatever break it is. But when you're there, you're on and you're running like crazy trying to get everything done. How do you make this a priority so that you have time to allocate to it? And, and John, I'll start with you. Uh, do you find that as a challenge to find the time to uh, to really maintain those relationships and, and truly kind of work at building your advisory committee? Um, not really. Once I figured out that this wasn't one more thing on my plate, when I figured out this was a powerful tool worth worthy of my time and effort, 
um, maintaining them is really easy because they're relationships. These are your friends now, people you know. And lost my train of thought, but yeah. Oh, you're good. And it takes a lot of the brain power away from you too, because when we're putting our stuff together, we're building that curriculum. It's all I want. I want as a teacher, this is what I want to do. That's the wrong approach. It's about what the students need and what the employers need. And if we're not talking to those advisory board members, we don't know what the needs are. So we're just kind of guessing point. in the dark. Uh, you, you're spot on. It's putting on the listening ears. And I, I think really being able to understand that. Britton, anything to, to add there in terms of how you prioritize this and, and make it a, a top priority for your program? Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's just that effort in, you know, the more effort you put into it, the, the better the, the results are going to be. And, and if we do remember that really these advisory boards, um, I mean, they're supposed to be running this meeting and, and you're just providing usually the venue or the space and, and, you know, and some information about the program and maybe some questions for them, right? But they're really doing a lot of the work. Um, if you set it up that way, I don't think it's, it's going to be as much work in, uh, as you think it's going to be. Um, but just valuing, valuing the process, right, and, and putting that work in at the beginning, um, I, I think you'll get great results and, and really value the people in your advisory board. If you work hard at it up front and you put those systems in place and you build a, a correct program, it's going to make your life easier and you're going to build a better program as a result. I think that intentionality behind it is so important. George, anything, uh, any bits of advice that you'd offer to these instructors on, on why they or how they make this a priority? Industry justifies the, the cost, value, the investment. You know, and your administrators can argue with you all day long. They don't know how to argue with business and industry instead of the taxpayer. Let those people speak for you. Um, and they're the ones hiring your students. So it doesn't get any easier than that. No, it, it, it sure doesn't. Now, we do have a couple of questions. We're right bumping up on our hour right now. Uh, but if you guys don't mind sticking around here just a second to answer these couple of questions, uh, one was a question that I, I thought we'd have time to touch on today, and we kind of ran out of time. But uh, Jason Olinger, our good friend, asks, uh, should the students be involved in the meeting? Uh, and I'll open this up to anybody. Yes. Yeah, I'll try. Um, we, always had, we always had the seniors come to the fall meeting, especially those that were involved in internships or work-based learning. And it's, it's very important to have them because then they go back and tell other students what's going on and how much the business community is involved in their program. They become your marketing tool. Yes. Yep. Absolutely agree. And, and we do invite same thing, second year students uh, to that fall meeting and, and have them meet with the board. And, and it's eye-opening for this. It really is eye-opening for the students also. And I think they do come away with a greater appreciation of what it takes to to do this program, right? And and maybe even motivates them to be a better student. <laughs> Hello, John. Yeah, um, I would actually have my juniors. I'd pick juniors that were rock stars. They would come in and take care of the minutes for me, so I could focus on on uh, the idea. agenda and. Anybody that was even thinking about doing an apprenticeship, I'd have them come in and meet the employers and generally they walk out with two to three offers. I, I can imagine. Uh, great advice. Uh, next question. And uh, John, I'm going to start with you, then Britton, then uh, go to George. Uh, what's the number one mistake you see instructors make with their advisory committee meetings? John, any, any insight there? Yeah, just kind of reiterating that they see it as that one more thing on the plate and put in minimal effort and they you'll reap minimal rewards. Britton? Yeah, just echo that. Um, it's, it's not just a checkbox and, and it shouldn't just be informational and, and really you shouldn't be running the meeting.
George? They schedule the meetings when it's convenient for them and not for industry. That's the biggest problem. And you wonder why people don't show up? Because you made it convenient for you, not for them. Clearly, you have no idea what's important to your business community or you would set the meeting up when it's convenient for them. And also, you would at least send out an invite 30 to 45 days in advance so you give them the opportunity to show up. You send out an email today for a meeting next Tuesday and you wonder why nobody showed up. It's your fault. <laughs> I see that all the time. That is a pet peeve of mine is I, I run my life by a calendar, right? And if I get if I get a an advisory committee invite, uh, a meeting invite, you know, a couple days beforehand, the chances I can make are uh, slim to none, right? It's uh, that's a that's a big challenge. Uh, thank you guys so much for joining us today. Is there any last words that uh, you guys have uh, for all the people out there? No. A quiet group. We're, we're, we're good. I think it was probably a terrible question more than anything, but I, I, I do thank you guys for joining us today and uh, hope you had fun. Hope you got value out of this. And uh, for those schools that are out there and even for our panelists, if you have any suggestions on what you want to see on this monthly panel, uh, let us know or suggestions on times that you want us to run this or uh, subject matter. Uh, feel free to reach out. We're all ears. We want to make this beneficial for all of you uh, that are taking time out of your day to do this. So uh, please reach out and, uh, and do that. So thank you guys for uh, for joining us. We, we really, really appreciate it. Thank you for uh, having us, Jay. Yep. Thanks and have a good day.